Okay, let's go into start. The first of all, today, uh, we still in India. Already we have a couple of times I live short in India. And, uh, I talking about politics and also, uh, general issues of India, the cultures and so forth. But now today, I'm going to show you the corruption, how the Indian corruption is, is currently undergoing now. Okay, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi removes two removes two of India most heavily and currently notes from circulation to hundred rupees, five hundred rupees and one thousand rupees, creating long lines at banks and leaving millions slapped for cash. CCTV correspondent Shweta Shweta Bajaj explain how business and people are dealing with the new policy. To explore the new policy's impact on tax, tax evasion and corruption. How to, how to, you know, uh, evade. How to, uh, using, uh, uh, not avoiding new bank, bank notes. Swatch Dingra, assistant professor of economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And Sadhana Doom, resident, resident fellow with the American Enterprise Institute and South Asia columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Samir Salang, the vice president of the Observer Research Foundation and author and commentator. Okay, let's have a look at this video. The first, and this one is, uh, uh, he's there talking about corruption and very Indian accent. So it's not easy to hear from those people talking. Next three videos, Indian people, with, uh, the native Indian people. in this country, I will do everything in my power to lessen your pain. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi removes two of India's most heavily used currency notes from circulation, creating long lines of banks and leaving millions strapped for cash. Hello, I'm Arun Nadu in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. Two weeks oh, his English is okay. Surprised okay. this country with the overnight elimination of large currency notes. The government banned the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes worth around seven dollars fifty and fifty US dollars. Okay, they abolished uh, uh, 500 rupees and 1,000 rupees. Caused a lot of problem in India. The policy is an attempt to crack down on tax evasion and corruption, but it's stunned millions of India's poor and working class to pay for everything in cash. We begin our coverage with CCTV Shweta Bajaj in New Delhi. And Shweta, the Modi government says the policy targets corruption and terrorist financing. How prevalent is corruption in India and how has it affected the economy? Well, the corruption has affected the various sectors of the Indian economy. Uh, to give you a sense, in the last five years alone, we've seen these massive corruption scams coming out, running into billions of dollars. There was, of course, the famous spectrum scam. Well, she said billions of dollars of corruption. And also the August Augustine scam, which scam is uh, is a kind of you know, uh, plot, which is, which is international news even now. But at the same time, uh, you also have issues, for instance, which are local in nature. For instance, India's infrastructure sector has been lagging. As she said, the infrastructure lags behind because of many lack of reforms. See, just the construction field, right? The acquisition laws. And law is, land acquisition law is so sophisticated. Really complex and many states are involved. Uh, there are other so officials ask them to get money. Corruption are concerned. For instance, a normal Indian also evades tax. Why is that? Because the tax labs are so complex that everybody tries to get out of it. Other than that, there are other ways to actually uh, be corrupt as far as India is concerned. There's a massive sector actually invests in gold uh, and keeps it at home and doesn't involve cash. 
that's another way uh, there's also arbitrary laws that are given to many many high officials in india corruption stems from high official is this is up I hope so. Is there some officer, high level officer? They ask them to there get money. Well. Uh, but Modi is trying to actually crack down on black money through actually banning five. Black money means that they uh, money is actually they deal in business underground. And then how to look at what's happening within the country? The cash which is within the country and the people which are. Uh, working on the cash economy front. Other than that, of course, there are massive holders of black money, even in sectors like real estate. They are also big. Real estate affected, but largely the common man also who actually deals in cash and doesn't really have a credit or a debit card. Right. So don't that don't really have a credit and debit card, and many people dealing business by cash, mm. is because of underground. So these money is coming on, you know, through the bank. So uh, nobody knows how, how much money is moving around. So the, the finally, uh, Modi, uh, he's talking about, okay, this country also will go into the cashless. So every transaction will go in through the bank. So uh, this is supposed to be no uh, black market dealing. Everything is through bank. No cash. Uh, China is the same intention. China already, uh, the cash is gone, right? But we've seen these long lines outside banks across the country. This is, he is talking about a long line outside the bank because they abolished 500 rupees and 1,000 rupees. Are people still struggling to get cash and how have businesses dealt with the new policy? This is, uh, have a look, very crazy uh, rule. The, the queues haven't... Queues is a, a line, a waiting line. really gone down at all. Uh, they have only been going longer because as people, they can only withdraw only in, in Indian rupees. 2,000 rupees, which is only 2,000 rupees once. So if they need more money, they need to line up again. Actually, less than 30 dollars. Uh, and after that, they have to stand in hours and hours uh, in queue to actually get another 2,000 rupees. So right. <laughs> See, another one. <laughs> basically, is your limit for... So finally, many people cannot exchange money. Mm. And 500 and 1,000 rupees expired. Still, they can change, they couldn't change See, money. Financial emergency to step out of the street every single ATM from morning to evening has massive queues. Uh, many of them actually run out of cash and then they shut. Uh, usually, the, the okay, many uh, many locations, many banks branch run out of cash, so they cannot change. The guard tells you that they will get cash only tomorrow. The banks are also cash trapped because remember, all the 500,000 rupees notes have been brought out of circulation. They have to dispense the new 2,000 rupee notes and the older 100 rupee notes which are obviously not in large number with banks. So massive issues even now on the street. As far as the economy is concerned, expect a hit. Uh, whether it is people, or day traders, for instance, they've had a massive hit in their businesses. And then you have other sectors which are much bigger in nature, for instance, the real estate sector, which is going to see, see, a, see a massive slowdown in the next few months to come. In fact, in the Indian economy, the Indian markets also have been reacting extremely negative after this week. Thanks, that's CCTV Shweta Bajaj reporting from New Delhi. Joining us now from London is Swati Dingra. She's an assistant professor of economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Here with us in the studio is Salman Dume. He's a resident fellow with the American Enterprise Institute and a South Asia columnist oh, those in the Street Journal. And from New Delhi, we're joined by Samir Sarai. Oh, this is a very difficult to listen. Of the Observer Research <laughs> Foundation and an author and commentator. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Swati, well, let me start with you in London. So the Prime Minister of India decides that he's going to withdraw these large denomination currencies from circulation. Okay, just he's uh, make a question for denomination. Abolish 500, 1,000 uh, um, banknotes, and he is going to ask for the first How lady. How does that stop corruption? And in your How does that stop corruption? Okay. You, is that a good move? I don't think it's a very good move. It's she said, I don't think it's a very good idea, right? I think it only flushes out minor petty corruption. Minor petty corruption. Just only effect of minor corruption because the presumption that the government is going by is that in fact people hold their black money in big currency notes of 500 and 1000 rupees. That is actually not correct and in fact the last time a demonetization was done in India in 1978 then the person who was in charge of the Central Bank of India at that time said that this was a completely sort of fruitless move. 
Well, see, this one is, I think, I, I don't understand this one, what she said. Sort of something she said. Um, is this the best way to tackle corruption in India, or does the government have other strategies? I don't think it's the best way. I agree with uh, Swati Singra. She agrees. I, uh, I'm also not sure that this whole obsession with unearthing thing, so-called black money, which is driving this decision, uh, is the right obsession for the government to have at this moment when India is in the midst of a rather shaky economic recovery. So on, on both counts, should this be the priority in the first place? Uh, I don't agree. And if this is your priority, is this the best way to go about it? Again, I don't agree. I think it would be much better for them to focus on simplifying rules, removing the discretion that bureaucrats have. He said he said the Barbara Bank knows that he shall, should consider for the simplify rules. Okay, removing that discretion. Tax officials have, uh, uh, tax trying officer. to reduce incentives for people to, to avoid taxes. So he said that he need to change uh, bureaucrat system. Rather than taking this uh, heavy-handed approach that they have. Heavy-handed is a uh, very strong mind, strong mind, strong power. But do you think the government feels that this is the root of the problem that, yeah, that people are holding cash for black wealth? I think the government thinks that this is a beginning. I don't think that this is the only move. They think that this is one part of it. And I think they're banking on the fact that many people in the Indian public have this sort of uh, Bollywood idea of, of... Bollywood idea is just rich person have lots of money. Bollywood, TV film. Uh, of, of rich, corrupt businessmen who store vast amounts of money in... Store vast amount of money... Builds um, under their mattress. Builds under their team. mattress. But <laughs> actually, this is... Or oh, is still cardboard. But this is a... Poor or middle class people, they have uh, bankrolls. But he going to say another way. somewhere. And uh, I think that they are banking on that uh, to create a sense of popularity uh, or to make what seems to be uh, an illogical move uh, seem like a virtuous move. Let's bring Samir in from New Delhi. And Samir, the announcement by the Prime Minister appears to have caused panic in India. We've just seen these pictures of long lines of banks. Uh, did the government not? This is ridiculous. Yes, uh, and they give them a few days, or uh, now not how many days, give them to change money. But uh, some middle, middle class or low class people, they try to have their bankrupt in their house, right? So they couldn't change money. Not anticipate that this would cause the kind of chaos that we're seeing with millions of people. He said, kind of chaos. Out of cash? Daily again, I mean, and I, <laughs> okay, just I think very um, difficult to uh, it has uh, not only uh, enacted a, a, a bad move on the 8th of November, but I, it has enacted the bad move means uh, abolish the bank rules. And it's even, even worse. And um, uh, some of the things that they have done uh, thereafter uh, lends uh, one to believe that uh, no one is in charge, no one is thinking. Um, for example, why would you have a 2,000 rupee note without having 500 rupee notes in circulation? So everybody never thinking about that before. Uh, why didn't you think about recalibrating the ATM machine? Um, you have now a pay cycle coming in. Okay, ATM machine is also occupied by people, long life. The end of this month, November 27, people are going to start getting the salaries for the next month. Um, are you... You mean the next month salary, how are you going to pay for them? You prepared to... Uh, meet the new demand, the new expectations that are going to come up. I think they've handled this pretty poorly. Uh, as far as the policy itself is concerned, you know, Saban... He said, criticize that this kind of policy change. This is no Savanna, but I don't know what means Savanna. And then Swati about right? Savati is the name of his name. Uh, to oh, me, no, former guys. This is a political proposition. He wants to be... Proposition, a proposal. India's disruptor in chief. He wants to be, as a colleague of mine calls him, the insurgent. He has shown. From that, uh, I'm not sure whether he's going to get away with it. He may have a silent poll that might be uh, uh, cast against him. We'll have to see. A few elections are coming our way. But certainly. Uh, election is uh, Narendra Modi's election. His political proposition is, and as Sadanan said, 
that he, he believes and this government believes that to the largest segment of the Indian population, the voting population, he has been seen to be, he can see, show himself to be someone who is doing something about corruption. So he said that how to improve the, the avoiding corruption. That's the reason he avoids uh, bank notes. His, his intention considered for the, his election. Swati, do you agree that this is more motivated by politics rather than economic common sense? Exactly. I think this is just... Oh, Swati is she. Your tokenism is supposed to... Okay, this one is... Uh, special. Tokenism is... Uh, Tokenism is uh, this one. Okay, this is true, but in in in, in mind, this different thinking approach. Okay, this is true, but actually different way. Tokenism. To give you this impression to the common man that there's something being done about corruption, while really this is really not flushing out corruption. It's also not tackling what people talk about that a lot of Indians have wealthy Indians have money in their accounts. Okay, this is the point. And actually, the rich people, they don't have cash in India. They have money in Swiss bank. So, if you really were serious about tackling corruption, that's where you would go. If really tackling corruption, this is the other way. Not sort of inconveniencing people, sort of common people who don't have it. So, common people have a uh, cold problem, right? other forms of payment, because most people in India don't have credit cards, they don't have debit most people didn't have a credit card or a debit card. So that you're looking at essentially inconveniencing low-income people in particular. So low-income people was affected. Right, looking at some figures here, uh, there was a study done by Google India as well as the Boston Consulting Group in July. They found that 78% of all financial transactions 78% of financial transactions in India, Swati, are handled in cash. Handled in cash. 78% transaction handled in cash because of all India, okay? Not rich people. Also, but also rich people, they try to handle cash because of the black market, right? Black market. Not through the bank account. Uh, so, question is, how does the government recover this so-called black money, these vast amounts of, I guess, off-the-box wealth, uh, estimated at something like $450 billion in it? Four hundred sixty billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So about four hundred million people in India have credit cards, and we're talking about four hundred million uh, people have a credit card. The one point two billion population, maybe even more than that now. So we're talking about very little credit card or debit card penetration. Now combine that with the fact that most people in India, the really wealthy, super rich, who might be doing a lot of corrupt deals, are not hoarding cash. So in that sense, if you're trying to not holding cash, holding, having cash, trying to flush out that money and bring it back into the real economy, you need to think of some other way of doing that, and that's been the experience in the past two demonetizations as well. That only about 15% of the currency in circulation actually came back, 85% of it didn't come back. So this is a completely ineffective way of doing any kind of sort of getting the black money back into the real economy. This is not the right way of doing it. So sorry, go ahead. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with what both Swati and Samir are saying. I think that one thing is that I'm willing to I'm willing to give the government the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they really believe this would work. Maybe this is not a cynical move. But even if it's even if it's not a cynical it's move, it's not the first time it, India has done it, right? Yeah, but not not nearly on this scale. The last time it was done, it affected a tiny fraction of the currency. So that was when something the, comparable. Ten thousand was in nineteen seventy eight. India today is very so, different to what India was then. Yeah. So I'm willing to acknowledge that perhaps the intentions were good, but by the way, this is an extremely uh, ignorant and blunt. Ignorant, no knowledge, no nothing known. Uh, blunt is uh, they're just not clever and foolish way to go about it. It's so also you know, hurt the most vulnerable groups, you know, people who are poor, people who are working class. Yeah, of course it will. And you know, I was uh, we were just having a discussion today uh, on this particular subject. And clearly, migrant labour, uh, the rural uncovered populations uh, who are outside of any post offices or banking networks. Uh, they are going to be the most affected, and uh, especially. So he's talking about uh, abolishing, you know, 500, 1,000 banknotes. Is very much affected for the immigrant people or uh, low, low, low-income people. 
Okay, this is just we are doing for collapsing in okay. India. Okay. In India, today is the third time, okay? So we are going to explain all the Indian uh, politics and the general issues. Now it's coming down to corruption. But this is, uh, beforehand is uh, those politicians can speak English fluently. They graduated from British University and so forth. But now it's uh, local Indian people talking mm -hmm. about. So this is not easy to listen what they're talking about. Yeah, I think the way they've explained this is that they needed to keep this very close hold because if news of it leaked out, then people who were sitting on these alleged mountains of cash would find ways to convert them into assets. So that was the explanation given for why this had to be kept uh, very close hold. Uh, my own sense is that this is a, a government that is acting with very, very few uh, decision makers not necessarily, all of them are not necessarily economically literate. Uh, they are counting on being able to brand anybody who uh, opposes this as somehow anti-national or against the national interest. Uh, but I mean, it's sort of, it's interesting because I've been on this show many times and I can't remember the last time we've had three guests who are in such violent agreement. <laughs> you are in violent agreement. So what you're telling me though, it seems that the government, uh, Savan, did not do any kind of intensive cost-benefit analysis when they're making this decision to say, look, look at what we're going to get out of this. Yeah, apparently not. Yeah. And there are some stories in the press, I mean, you can take them with a grain of salt, that yeah. says, you know, these are ideas being... Okay, this is easy, easy, easy. This is just, don't, don't listen to all of those, what they say. 
battled by all kinds of, you know, quacks and the yoga guru kinds of, so, you know, some of these stories are, you know, are, are actually uh, really quite scary. Now the question really is, what does he do going forward? And I agree with Samir over there that if he puts in place a series of other measures uh, that are sensible, uh, then this could be perhaps, you know, forgiven. Uh, but my worry really is that this is the first move, this is the first bad move in a series of bad moves. Uh, this is talking about uh, Polish uh, 500, 1,000 rupees. And also he criticized uh, officials. That what this shows is a kind of belief in the tax authorities and the bureaucracy. This notion that he has the most uh, clean and efficient set of bureaucrats that he's going to empower. My worry is that he's going to let these people lose now on businessmen. This is basically a license to extort for them. And what you're going to see is a further no erosion of business. Sentiment. And that's my big worry right now. And I hope that doesn't happen. Okay, go ahead. So maybe you want to say something? No, uh, you know, I think. The so, former guy said, okay, just actually uh, abolishing the bank loan, but also government officers forced them, for business people forced them to pay tax, uh, avoiding tax evasion. This is oddly happening, what is, uh, what we are witnessing. So, I mean, I, I, let me make two comments. One was, I am not entirely convinced that um, he may not be able to swing this his way politically. I am not convinced. Uh, you know, uh, I have been speaking to people outside these uh, banks and these long, in these long lines and, and some of the small petty traders. And uh, there, some seem to enjoy the discomfort of the bigger one. Uh, I'm not sure that he's going, to, he's going to lose out big in terms of the politics behind this move. Uh, but I am quite convinced that the whole thrust to make India uh, a more business-friendly destination is going to take a hit. And I think when you allow your taxmen to become arbitrary in their search and seizures, um, it is not very conducive for investments and for people to uh, divert large chunks of their investments to uh, certain sectors. And I think that is something that worries me more um, than um, uh, the political gimmickry, because I think, in a sense, you are um, uh, you are you are, you are, you, are be, you, you are taking away one of the key elements of your uh, political mandate and of your uh, proposition, which was economics, which was good business, which was increasing Indian GDP and Indian uh, and supporting the Indian growth story. So you know you are in a sense shooting yourself um, uh, in the foot. Oh, this is. A, this is a, and finally, he's a uh, typical Indian English, so very difficult to <laughs> understand what he said. Uh, he said, okay, just abolishing banknotes. Instead, we need to reconsider for the, how to reform their business. And last, he said, okay, this one is uh, bribes. And in summary, they have uh, Modi abolished the banknote, but actually, the, they need to look for that to explore another way of policy to consider for how to uh, avoid tax evasion and corruption. Okay, and uh, now is moving to information technology in India. This is usually I uh, this one is uh, I just uh, bring discussion to discussion, but also this is pure <laughs> Indian people discussion. But no, not easy, easy to listen. <laughs> so this is information, information technology in India is an industry consisting of two major components, IT service and business process outsourcing, BPO. The sector has increased uh, its contribution to India's GDP from 1.2% of 1998 to 7.5% in 2012. It's kind of 7.5, would be huge. It's just same as Philippines, okay? GDP. According to NASCOM, at NASCOM is the association of uh, IT development organized by government. The sector aggregated revenues of US $147 billion in 2015 with export revenue standing at $99 billion US dollars and domestic revenues at $48 billion US dollars, growing by over 13%. India's current Prime Minister Narendra Modi has started a project called Digital India to help secure IT, a position both inside and outside of India. 
But this is no uh, demonstration for like advanced technology, but, but, uh, three person discuss about, <laughs> about the future of India. Okay. No, 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 this one, this one. So this one. Okay, decode dec India as IT sector. I'll show you this, this video. This one is IT industry has put India on the world map. But will the sector continue to hold away? Or is it sheen, this demission? Yes, I'm talking about this kind of discussion. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. The investors, the discussion there. Show that aims to educate you about making informed and wise decisions. She is Indian, <laughs> okay. And uh, this this video is three speakers, and uh, they are all Indian, mm -hmm. and uh, they are never educated in the states, so their English is uh, Indian English, not easy to listen. Okay? I'm Samira Abdi, and this week we take a close look at the IT sector. It's an industry that has put India on the world map. The information technology sector, which contributes 7.5% to India's GDP, has two major components. I don't know how come, but 7.5% GDP contribution, same as Philippines. I don't know how, how, how much in China, but uh, India, China, and Philippines is most advanced IT uh, technology adopt, adopting country, okay, and it, especially India, Philippines is their language in English. Immediately, IT software ex importing from United States. So those people using American software, online based. So immediately they import software from the states. Okay. IT services and business process outsourcing, or BPO. Both segments generated a revenue of $147 billion in 2015, with exports alone constituting $99 billion. These numbers have made it possible for India to emerge as the world's largest sourcing destination for the IT industry. Not only is this largely responsible for the country's economic transformation, it has also changed the perception of India globally. The country's cost competitiveness in providing IT services is three to four times more economical compared to the U.S. In okay, so three or four times uh, India is cheaper than the United States. Indian IT companies have also helped global clients save up. But actually, the now is there uh, the using AI and robotics, right? So now is they are using AI and robotics, it means cost is now down to one tenth. So it's almost a revolution is undergoing now. For whopping two hundred billion dollars over the last five years. Recognizing the huge pool of talent and skill available in India, several global IT firms are setting up their innovation centers in India. The industry, which provides employment to over 10 million people, now seems to be at an inflection point. Okay, inflection, inflection point. Okay, you just alive, okay. You just alive? Yes. But this is iPhone, right? Yeah, this is mobile iPhone, right? Mobile phone, right? Yes. You are going back your home? Yes. Okay. Okay. Just move. I'm going to. You can see the screen, right? Yes, I can see. 
Okay, now is I've just started uh, IT uh, strategy in India. Just started. Okay, people and I did uh, some bribes, corruption of India. Now moving to IT strategy of in the current situation. Next two or three uh, video is uh, talking about IT, IT, ICT. Moving from enterprise servicing to enterprise solutions. He said the infection point is now is a turning point. It's, uh, it's drastically changing now. So will the sector continue to hold sway or is its sheen diminishing? And with me now, we have Raul Zubari, Vice ICI Securities, Chaitanya Shahari from IFO Markets and Frontline Holdings, Arunas Giri. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining in. So it's the ID stocks, uh, the entire bunch that we're looking at uh, this week. Okay, she's she's English a little bit much better, but uh, the other three guys, they are the local <laughs> India. I very difficult to listen what she talk, they are talking um, about. You know, all the way back <laughs> from 3 years and I think the story uh, that is coming out is that wage arbitrage which is the common denominator that benefited all the companies out there uh, is not a powerful uh, you know proposition for the Indian IT services companies to take to their uh, customers so the feedback from the customer is you know are you interesting partner for us on the digital technologies you know do you have cloud solutions things like that that add value in the current context when the entire ecosystem is digitizing itself. So I think that's where the challenge is coming for growth. Okay, fair enough, but um, if okay, he is to the point of being near wealth destroyers, right? I mean, is it just like a temporary disruption, you think, Chaitanya? Or is it more that uh, this is the way things are going to be? Is it just a blip in their cycle? So what I would say is the more... Okay, his opinion is fairly good. Listen. on... 15, 20 years back has changed. So the complete industry has changed. So it's a world of changing technology, fast changing technology. Earlier where people were spending on application development, now they are moving to SaaS or AI or robotics. Wherein... I don't know, SaaS, maybe machine learning? Yeah. You know that? Machine learning? No. Huh? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, SaaS. <laughs> the CIO, uh, Fortune 500 CIO, wants to spend on more on SaaS rather than application development. So they want to move more into analytics, more into customer facing, which into a technology which will help them generate more revenues or reach out to those customers wherein I will grab them, I will get them uh, to hook to my services or products and generate more revenue. But in Indian companies, the model has been the same. I want to develop, uh, give a service for software development and then manage them. So he is talking about the need to consider for AI and robot for for their current business, BPO and IT service so forth, right? The question which they are asking is whether it is uh, the headwinds are structural or cyclical. A uh, bit of history would help. Now if you go back uh, how the industry evolved, a uh, lot of it came from the increase in offshoring and also the traditional IT spending, which is more on uh, legacy ADM uh, services. Now what's happening now is the share of offshoring is stabilizing and you're seeing a very visible uh, decline in uh, IT spending, traditional IT spending. Actually, the currently uh, India is uh, firing employees uh, working at uh, I traditional IT industry. Okay, so they are much more concerned about retraining of uh, people working at IT industry. Okay, so former guy said AI and robotics, this is now is shifting to the, uh, the skill requirement for employees. The Indian people is now changing their skill. Mm -hmm. that, this is what so with these about. two levers of the large players are finding it difficult to grow. Now with muted growth in India's economy now, GDP growth, the pressure on IT spending will persist, which means uh, they will struggle to uh, grow. 
and with uh, add, add to that the deflationary impact of automation digital and cloud it's very difficult to build a bullish case for it so structurally it is weak from here on what will happen for the large players is that it is going to be market share gains you know the game of market share gains the guy who invested well on digital the company which has got management which is uh, good in execution which has got scale will be able to capitalize on these opportunities okay so you oh by the way takashi Oh, you, uh, you can listen the the video. Hello. Yes, hello. Do you understand this Indian English? Uh, actually, I <laughs> I cannot hear clearly because the sound is not good. Oh, really? Uh, can I can I connect again from my PC? Is it's been ready? What do you mean connect again? Just cut it out for. Yeah. Cut out and connect again. Yeah. Okay. So switch from mobile to PC. Okay. 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 Okay, I connected. Speak, speak something. Uh, yeah, now sound is okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. How about this one? This English, okay? You mean to say that uh, the plane will not? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Some Better. As such, are gonna get yeah. gobbled okay. up, or they're gonna just fizzle out on their own. There's no scope left for them, right? Uh, what if a person is holding something like that in their portfolio? Is this now the time to exit? Because in any case, he's not going to get a good exit opportunity for the next few years. What does that person do? I would say every five years or every ten years, there is always a disruption. Okay, when I talk about okay, he is talking about five years, ten years. They have fraction point changing, you know, world of IT strategy, IT things, so forth. Uh, microeconomic factor, micro even the technology development, they change over a period of time. So whenever a new technology comes into picture, your margins will get affected. Fair enough, but what's the takeaway for the investor then? I think uh, if you look at it from a value investment point of view, probably this is a great time to invest because the valuations, you know, do not seem that expensive, and some of the large companies that were growing extremely fast have mellowed down. And that gives a very interesting entry point for somebody who wants to hold the stock for a for some period of time because the response from some of the large IT companies has also been very very interesting. I mean, they're acquiring companies, they're investing in automation, they are running innovation labs for their customers. So they. By the way, three guys is investors, okay? Investors, not IT specialists. Preparing themselves, you know, for that big change. If you look globally, a company like Accenture. I mean, their digital business is sizable. Well, he's talking about know, Accenture. Close to about seven billion dollars, growing at thirty percent. Oh my goodness, seven billion dollars in India! So the opportunity is there. Just the Indian IT services companies are just in seven billion. No, global level. Adjusting to the new reality. Rahul, you're a brave man, and I'll tell you why you're so brave. Because you're taking this contra bet. In the week that we've seen Trump dial up the rhetoric on, uh, you know, job exports. So perhaps a person is now investing with the uh, hope slash fear that he could be the next president for the next four years. There's Brexit. There's increasing worries in the BFSI space. Should the investor really be that brave? The dynamic of the industry is that talent is more important today, and the depth of talent in the in the U.S. economy or any other developed economy is not all that great to basically power their digital strategies. The world will have to rely on companies like Infosys that are in countries like India. So yes, I think uh, the regulatory action uh, or the political backlash will impact the Indian IT services companies. But some of these companies are already already preparing themselves with on-site resources. You know, they want to be more local. So the cost will go up a little bit of doing business, but the value proposition is not going to vanish. I would say uh, agility in the company would be most important here. Because it's a fast-changing environment, even if there is a B uh, B R. So just listening for Indian people, 
Uh, they, are, they are very uh, much studying about Western trend. So he said agility, right? Sir, so there is a storm coming in. How soon you can change your model to a new, uh, the outdated model to a new model? Or how soon you can actually redeploy your resources, key resources, into a new project or new stream of business? That will be a key factor here for investing into these stocks. So he is talking about very, uh, the, the Indian people need to focus on more, more advanced, you know, model, advanced skill, enhancement, so forth. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about uh, companies then, right? Uh, so we've seen emphasis actually uh, keep the leadership mantle for a goodish number of years, right? Uh, there was a lag in the middle where we saw TCA sort of overtake them. Uh, TCS2 over there, it looks now like the valuations are peaking, right? Not a lot of brokerage houses are very, very bullish on how things could shape up in the future. Which is going to be the next leadership stock? I mean, if someone was to look at the frontline IT space, what would be that one stock? Could something like, say, a Tech Mahindra or a Vipro actually scale themselves up to that quality? When you look at the larger uh, players, uh, it is a challenging time. By the way, Mahindra is an automobile company, but... Uh at this place he is talking about Mahindra IT. It's not going to be easy because the size is very large and the digital market is uh, small. So from here on as I see it, it is going to be uh, market share gains. So it is going to depend on which management is uh, much more efficient in execution, which management has got much better scale. So when you look at it from that point of view, it looks, uh, you know, uh, like TCS and Infosys has gone in. Uh, PCS is a software company. Uh, kind of an edge when it comes to market share gains. Tech Mahindra probably is one vertical dependent. A lot of their business comes up from telecom. Though they have gone through bad, ter uh, bad times, they are in a recovery mode. Of course, the stock would recover when the, uh, uh, when the sentiments in telecom improves. But I'm not sure whether they could compete and uh, overtake uh, people like by the way, Indian people discussing kind about you know discussing about he said telecom so forth right, and uh, do you remember the two thousand eight or nine NTT Docomo uh, invested lot of money for Tata Group. Actually, the five or six years later failed because this is Japanese in this is evaluate Indian people behind technology something like that. We are the first, but no, no, they are advanced rather than. Japan, right? Yeah. This is a, if going to, they going to Japanese people management, they have a look at the kind of video, they should, did, did know, uh, very big threat for Japanese company. Recently, Japanese company is very big behind, because they don't consider for China, Philippines, India is behind them. No, no, behind, they're not behind, behind Japan. So my bet will still be with the large cap companies, uh, because the mid cap, uh, companies are more nimble, but at the same time, their earnings might be more volatile because of the customer concentration issues. Also, the large cap companies are better positioned with their balance sheet to invest in these emerging technologies. And also, they benefit from the fact that they can attract better talent. So, I think it's a mixed bag to a certain extent. Is there nothing in the uh, mid cap or the small cap space? Mid cap, mid size company. I mean, for a value investor, right? So, they've already missed the boat on the bigger companies, right? If they were to go out today and look for something to invest in, perhaps in the next 15, 20 years, um, is there anything that strikes you from the smaller uh, companies? So, mid-cap, when I talk about, they are very agile. Okay, they are small. But when I talk about, even the model is not differentiated. The people or the companies which are the top management differentiating their model and investing into he said he recommend differentiating their model. A new technology. New technology. I'm investing in uh, the digitization. When I talk digitization is uh, AI and robotics. About digitization, uh, India is talking about smart cities, digital payments. Or oh, smart city, right? Digital economies. So companies who are investing into such new stream of business. Yes, it's a risky stream, but he, he said, but risky. People who will get into such streams, new streams make new business vertical out of nothing which is a big space is there but nobody is catering to so this mid cap might be a multi bagger over a period of time multi bagger is uh, bagger is uh, is baseball bagger heating 
eat in the bag. But yes, choosing those stocks is most important as of day, as of now. So we can't just say, okay, this company or this management is good, so they are doing well and they will come up as a multi-bagger over a period of time. No, this will feature single bagger is just uh, one one home, right? Multi-bagger is many times, many times. In the next one or two years, we will come to know, okay, the management is putting a lot of efforts. Even the mid caps today, they are doing small steps here and there. But no concrete step is happening wherein I say, yes, I will actually help government set up a digital economy. In mid and small cap, it is uh, also important not to uh, paint all of them with a single brush. There is a, uh, you know, there are companies which are not in the same bridge, which are building uh, very strong product stories. Uh, there is a company like Intellect, which is building a very strong story on um, consumer banking and core banking product solutions. Similarly, they have a company which is uh, based out of Google on uh, nuclear software, which has got a very leading, uh, uh, you know, robust platform for lending solution. So there are differential stories within small and mid cap which can create uh, wealth and value for a long period of time for value investors. One would have hoped for, you know, more diversity in the IT or the technology <laughs> sector. And there's just a few uh, of these companies. So for example, on consumer internet, we have InfoEdge, which is a fine example. Uh, in security services, we have Quick Heal. And, you know, with the private funding which we've seen from the VC community and the private equity funds, one hopes that there'll be more interesting names that'll come into the capital market. So it's good you raise this point of diversity within the sector, right? Because even within what's existing now, hardware, software, KPO, BPO, uh, what's the next leg of growth going to be built on? If you look at the BPO space, I think that's where the robotic uh, process automation is. Yeah, the shifting for BPO, robotic process automation. RP, no, RP, robotic process, RP automation. RPA solutions are really, you know, uh, basically attacking the core of the margin profile of these companies. So I wouldn't go there. Uh, as far as the hardware companies are concerned, hardware is a commodity today. So if, you know, there's a company that addresses hardware with embedded software and applications, yes, that's an interesting space to go to. Domestic, I think, localization of manufacturing might be a good story to pursue, but we do not have any you know, examples of that in the capital markets. So that leaves us with the software uh, services space where most of the investing would happen. Okay, everybody sort of comes Everybody back is there. <laughs> okay. Uh, sure. uh, there is a space which is very interesting in the IoT space. Yeah. You know, uh, internet. IoT. Uh, internet of Things. You know, there is a very growing, it's a growing uh, space. Currently it's very small. There is a consumer IoT and there is a industrial IoT. Now, there are uh, companies like Vipro and Excel Tech, which has traditionally been uh, evolved from the hardware business. They have those skills to develop a very strong business in IoT. So that could be one emerging uh, story within the large players who have got uh, hardware background. <laughs> Okay, so now we figured out how to select the stock, right? Um, you remain invested for whatever term suits you, uh, perhaps for longer if you're a value investor. What is the key to look at while exiting a stock in the IT space? How big of a headwind is something like a currency or, you know, regulatory overhangs in other economies? What should be that one key trigger for selling or should it just be when your time is up, you're done with the stock? So I, I believe such triggers can't be defined as of now because it's a fast changing world. When you say 20 years back what Infosys did to EDS and HP by giving a lower uh, cost for software development, someone can come up, a small, uh, even a startup may come up and say, okay, this is my product and service in which I am selling SaaS or cloud, I am giving AI, I am giving robotics. No, he's and old. Old, old, old time, 20 years ago, but now is she talking about we really going to consider for robotics? So and they can come up and say, okay, they can actually wipe out the margins. So there is no as such a trigger when we can say, okay, I should exit. But yes, you should understand what's going in the world. In future, probably there will be different triggers wherein I can take out the money or invest in, the, in certain sectors. Okay, fair enough. 
In that case, how does one read uh, the guidance picture by a company, right? So once they give a guidance in their quarterly meet, uh, that's written in stone for the market, right? Uh, if they were to backtrack on their guidance, if they were to raise the guidance, what does that do in terms of a trigger for the stock for a person who's already invested in that stock? So I would be a investor for the long term uh, because the volatility is just going to increase in the quarterly earnings. The reason being, companies are investing for the future. They are reskilling their workforce. They are acquiring companies overseas, and that adds to a lot of noise. And sometimes the earnings, uh, you know, guidance is missed. Uh, you know, so this is the transition phase where the investor should really, you know, uh, be looking at the longer term picture and really look at you know the quality of the match. Yeah, this is a point on every country. Uh, Philippines and China say uh, same word instead of Japan. Japan is no no long range planning. He said longer term picture. Longer term picture he said for 10 years. Management, quality of the customer base, you know what are the strategic um, actions that the company has taken. Japanese don't have a strategy. They he said strategy. Prepare themselves for this transition period. I think that's that's important. If the long term picture is outlook is uh, stable and if the prospects are strong for the company, the investor will all. This is a car is very good example. Toyota is uh, they just consider for the next three years, and they invest EV, hydrogen, and uh, normal engine. But uh, overseas company they uh, strategic approach they adopted like a Nissan for the next ten years, just only EV. Already investment. Should look at that as an opportunity. The same thing he said. Mm. Because we have seen historically, whenever there has been a, a sharp correction because of short term uh, guidance issues, uh, it has always been an opportunity for long term value investors. Okay, so in that case, uh, once you get the PL of a company, uh, what would you look at first, right? What's the most important metric? Would you look at dollar revenue if that's okay or doing better? Everything else can take a back seat. The primary importance which we give is for the business profile. So the first uh, factor we look at is in, in terms of technology practices. If you take an IT company, it has got different technology practices. It has got a, a traditional ADM practice. It has got IMS, which is uh, recently go, growing strong. It has got uh, BPO. So different practices, the recent ones are you know, digital and cloud. So each of these revenue profiles are different. If we take uh, ADM practice, it's very sticky. It's annuity based, so which is more predictable. If you take an enterprise uh, application practice, which is more like project based revenues, so it's not sticky. So overall, when you evaluate the practices, you get to know how the revenue profile for the company is. Similarly, you look at the industry verticals, you know, in terms of BFSI, telecom, uh, ENU, or CPG, so retail. So each of these uh, verticals has got a different growth profile. For example, currently ENU is going through a slowdown. BFSI is going through a slowdown. Your telecom is just coming up a recovery. Your CPG is all right. Healthcare is a bit of a problem because of m &A. So based on these uh, verticals, you will be able to assess what kind of growth profile you can assess. Then you move on to financials and see the return ratios, margin profile, cash flow generation, volume growth, and the uh, trigger. You know, you could have a, uh, a leverage from utilization, hiring. So all those factors you combine and see what is the business is worth and then look at what the current price, whether does it give margin of safety for the kind of business it is worth. If there is a substantial margin of safety, then you go ahead and invest. That's what the long term investors. Okay, he's talking about uh, where to make invest market money investment, value to buy, area of investment invest. So, uh, depending on which which area they're going to focus on. You should look at. All right, um there's a fear also in the market that perhaps NASCOM could lower their FY17 guidance as well, right? Given the way the companies have lowered their uh, outlook for their own businesses. Uh, would that also be a trigger then to buy for a long-term investor? I think the NASCOM guidance has to be uh, looked along with the global uh, estimates for growth <coughs> in the industry. So the industry... Uh, this is exactly the same issue Chinese government announcement very recently, the same as NASCOM. <coughs> uh, analysts are saying that the growth is there. If at all, technology is uh, integral part of every next 10 years plan. Industry can <coughs> so it will be 3.5 trillion dollar technology spent by 2020. 
eighty percent of the international is coming from digital technologies. So you know, if Indian IT services companies are not going to benefit from that, that's more of a overall challenge for the space and the transformation which is happening. But I wouldn't be surprised that in the short term there would be an adjustment. But the long term guidance, I don't think that would fundamentally change. Yes, short term adjustment. To prepare for the long-term uh, view here. Just to wrap it up, what's the advice uh, for IT investors? I mean, uh, anything that they should look out for, any challenges in the next few years, or opportunities as you guys see them. Oh, uh, in my view, opportunities always come in a downturn. IT sector currently is going through such a challenge, uh, some of which is structural, some of some of which is tactical. But uh, value could emerge in large uh, large players as well as in small and mid cap. Large players who are, uh, has the potential to increase market share will benefit out of this downturn. So you should look out for the such companies. Small and mid cap will look for differentiated stories. People who are in the product side who are building good product in a very niche space, they have very very strong prospects. That's where the industry should look out. I don't know. You've just taken the safe food because you've given one dish for everybody, right? So you've recommended a Gujarati thali for the investor. Somebody will find everything over there. What about you, Rahul? I would say, you know, uh, just don't look for scale. Uh, look for capability, and that's a very difficult uh, thing to do. But I think that's where people should be spending time. I would say IT sector is going through a transformation phase, uh, and. Here, probably a strategy move or a tactical move by the top management should be looked upon, and how they are bringing in differentiation, how they are doing or reskilling, reskilling their own uh, workforce, learning and relearning, and then again, how they are. He is uh, talking about uh, this point is very important: learning and e-learning for their. Employee. Actually, creating new business streams or new industry verticals. Creating new business team because this is what he's talking about for AI and robotics instead of current traditional BPO. This should be looked upon by even the small cap, mid cap, or even the frontline players. If the top management are the strategy making a strategy move to such streams, this should be looked upon for a longer term. All right. Uh, there's been a lot of learnings from this show for myself, as I'm sure for our viewers, gentlemen. Thanks very much for your time. At okay, this is uh, this video talking about the major point is uh, Japanese company is uh, just only thinking about next few years, but Indian company, these three guys, investment banker, and uh, those people recommendation need to focus on ten years strategy. Rather than short range, so also they recognize uh, the BPO is all drastically changing now. So uh, every management, big company, mid size, small size, they need to reconsider their uh, current business and uh, more focus on the AI robotics. And most important issue is you need to uh, training for the employees. And also need to change in the career path of the employees. That, that's a message they're talking about. How do you think? Takashi, how do you think? Can you ask? Sir? Huh. What do you say? Uh, just think of what you <laughs> Okay, I'm moving to the next one. Yeah. Okay, I have my next one. Another is a uh, sorry about that. Next one is also IT. <laughs> Tougher time ahead for in the IT industry. This is a little different uh, discussion. Okay, uh, it seems there is no light at the end of the tunnel for IT big wigs in India. Once a poster boy of the Indian economy, the IT sector is likely to face further headwinds. Vion is a company, company name. Vion brings you uh, more on this. World, world is one news. Uh, Vion ex exam examines global issues with in-depth analysis. We provide much more than the news of the day. Uh, our aim is to empower people to explore their 
Old. Okay, this one is uh, two points. They are talking about firing employees because of mismatch skill and at, at the IT industry. Many people are firing now. Japanese should not happen like this. And already uh, the India and Philippines, they already started firing employees for IT industry. Okay? This one. India's IT sector and how it could take a huge hit with about 200,000 jobs at stake. Uh, 200,000 jobs at stake is fire. Okay, that's just fire now. Some of the companies that are laying off employees, especially in the field of IT. Cognizant is the worst hit with as many as 6,000 layoffs, about 3% of its workforce. Cognizant is reportedly struggling with new technologies, digital services, and redundant lower jobs that are now automated. Tech Mahindra has let go of more than 1,000 employees this month alone. With rumors of Flipkart's acquisition, Snapdeal plans to act 30% of its mm. workforce as a result of poor growth and reduced revenue, impacting more than 1,000 employees as well. IT giant Wipro also plans to trim the fat and get rid of some project leaders thanks to the result of automation. DxO Technology plans to have a number of offices in India and lay off around 10,000 people over the next three years. And IT giant Infosys plans to chop 1,000 jobs, mostly project manager positions as well as senior architects. Now, all of this could also be attributed, possibly as a result of US President Donald Trump's policies, as many IT firms are now choosing to hire US citizens and asking H-1B visa holders to return to India instead. Oh, he's talking about visa, uh, talking visa, because uh, Trump is they try not to hire Indian people instead the hiring American people. So many people come back state to India. Are they not reaching their quota? Have they recruited more than what is supposed to be working in an organization? So multiple factors, right? So it's a management decision which they have taken. But I mean, it completely depends on, uh, it, it's going to throw a massive pressure on a lot of people. Problem lies in, you know, uh, in both the uh, segments. The one is the people who are completing the studies without skills and the second one are the companies who are hiring without, you know, evaluating them right at the first step. Part of the process, right? I mean, you know, the companies will have projects and based on that they'll hire or recruit people. The project gets over, they start laying off. So that's their process. So you, I mean, you know, that will continue to happen. The layoffs happen, happen and it will continue to happen. That's the harsh truth of this industry that we Oh, those are the people that are laid off. All right, again, perspective of the story, we're joined by Sanjeev Alavalia, advisor and observer for Research Foundation here in Studio New Delhi. We also will later be joined by Chaitanya Mudaburi, the co-founder and CEO of Ray Mistech from Hyderabad, and our Chennai correspondent, Revati Rajivan from the ground there. Let me first start with uh, our guest here in the studio. Thank you so much for joining us. The first question is, why now? Why are so many IT companies facing that blunt, facing so many uh, uh, job cuts and trimming the fact? <clears throat> Arjun, let's look at the uh, light at the end of the tunnel first. You know, the fact that there are layoffs is actually a good thing. I mean, it's very traumatic for the people involved. That's good. But if you look at what it means for the industry, and if you look at what it means for the credibility of the Indian regulatory system. Right. I think what it's telling international investors is that, listen, Indian labor markets are liquid. You, know, you hire people, we have lots of people who are available, and then if business requirements... But before, and the in, uh, Indian labor law is very strict. Whenever you hire, very difficult to... Uh, whenever you hire, very difficult to fire them because of very strict regulation. That's the reason uh, the major objective of Narendra Modi's plan to uh, change labor law. But still nothing happened. Because uh, India has seven states and no communication with each other. <laughs> so very difficult to change the law. But this is, he's talking about this. Uh, not there. You can let them go. 
and they do actually go. I mean, it is a very sort of a natural process in any kind of a consultancy or a, as John uh, was saying, or your reporter was saying, you know, in a project-based type of organization. But clearly, this is not just a normal layoff syndrome because uh, there are reports that over the last, in fact, I think the government uh, spokesperson came out with a statement that over the last two and a half years, uh, the ID industry has added incrementally about 200,000 or 300,000 jobs. And now, you know, we're kind of letting go of almost a similar amount in the first year. And maybe so it's even a little ironic to see yeah. that, that number. So, like well, that. I mean, it's ironic because, you know, uh, everyone knows that the business opportunity was in uh, supplying good quality labor at very affordable rates. And because there there are now, and you know, it is all done under the open economy new neoliberal system that the world had bought into, and India bought into in 1991. Right. But we find today that things have changed. That because there is a downturn in the countries that spawn the neoliberal philosophy, they are now battening down the hatches and putting up barriers. So as a result, India has to think anew. And I'm pretty sure that the government will think of you. Uh, He's talking about uh, new technology. Our company is going to be made, and we would be able to redeploy people who have been laid off from these overseas strategically oriented uh, areas into the domestic economy. Don't forget that there is a huge push in uh, the digital area. And government is coming online. Tax systems are being improved. And so all this really means that for a IT resource personnel, or a person who's interested in IT, right. there are going to be a lot of opportunities. This but perhaps new opportunities. Right? New opportunities. So new opportunity means uh, the aspect of the employees change skill, change careers. But I think the person has to be willing to look beyond, you know, just getting a job and going overseas and coming back after one year. Absolutely. All right. So there is some adjustment to be done on both sides. Overall, good for the companies because they're, they're being able to protect their bottom line. Some companies have not laid off anybody at all. I believe the Tata's, for instance, I have no hesitation in mentioning that. Uh, they have not laid anybody off. So it's not like every of these things is allowed. Right. Those who have a strong revenue model, who have thought these things through, who have a strong culture of supporting their employees, who have a strong culture. So he said Tata, is, they, uh, they do not fire anybody. Which Strong culture, he said. Their revenue stream with, you know, employee requirements, they will do okay. Those employee requirements. Bad, they very short -sighted. Well, they not short-sighted? They will suffer. Uh -huh. But hey, that happens in many other in many industries, industries not just IT. Yeah, including me. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's now go to uh, our correspondent in Chennai, Revati Rajiv, standing by Revati. You know, uh, you've been there on the ground talking to people. Uh, you know, Chennai is certainly one of the, uh, the big IT sectors here in India. Uh, you know, uh, many of the IT companies uh, are denying this, but what are some of the short term and long term impacts of these layoffs and job cuts, Revati? Well, uh, well, Ashut, yes, uh, I have been talking to these employees who have been asked to resign or who have already resigned uh, as the management has asked them to do. But uh, uh, two concerns here that I have come across uh, that is common to all these employees. One, that there has not been any written communication that has been given to these employees either, uh, you know, as a hard copy or an email that is uh, sent to these employees. Uh, uh, that I've, uh, I've been talking to have told me that they were personally called by the HR one by one and were asked to voluntarily submit their resignation. Okay. So there is no really written evidence uh, that they can uh, actually furnish against the company saying that uh, they have been uh, asked to uh, resign voluntarily and uh, illegally against the policies of the company. That is one. Oh, she is talking about uh, no document, no paper, just only the telegram. Two, uh, most of these uh, employees that I have been speaking to are uh, uh, 
uh, those with about uh, say 10 to 12 years of experience which means that they are uh, perhaps settling down in their life settling down with their career so at this point uh, they are perhaps uh, thinking that okay uh, i have a job in hand and that's something that's secure and they are not perhaps thinking of moving uh, perhaps they have family back home and uh, several factors like that so uh, these kind of employees are most affected so uh, for them switching jobs at this point of time how possible it is how possible it is and whether other companies would be willing to hire uh, these many people uh, with uh, this experience or would they go for pressure to they, whom they would want to hire and groom from the beginning and uh, absorb into their company that is a concern so these two concerns are what i have been uh, observing uh, among these employees but as far as chennai is concerned uh, one of the companies have uh, responded have met the labor commissioner where uh, uh, a hearing is going on at the moment and they have asked for one week's time to respond to this issue but uh, primarily they have denied that, that it, there is any sort of mass layoffs that are happening in these companies they have pointed out they have said uh, and defended uh, their side that uh, these are all only individual cases now there are uh, on one side uh, these many employees are saying that they have been asked to uh, voluntarily resign but with no uh, written evidence of that and on the other side the company is denying is completely saying that these are individual cases actually all right okay we'll come back to you just a second let me now go over to chaitanya mudamuri uh, co-founder for uh, ray bisek from hyderabad joining us uh, uh, good evening to you uh, my question to you is uh, the impact the implications of these is this something that people who are perhaps uh, looking at going into it should be concerned about and uh, you know uh, some of the younger folks are perhaps looking to uh, uh, carve out a career is this perhaps a bad time to uh, to be in that industry hey, Oh, this is an uh, Indian company, some CEO, this guy, Tolkien Samson. But to be on the show, uh, uh, there, see, there is uh, a cause for concern right now in terms of uh, what's happening, but then, but then again, as uh, as Le Sanjeev said, uh, it is uh, not all bad. It is actually good news because it actually forces us to look at our uh, education. Uh, what's happening with uh, education and uh, uh, how we can skill uh, existing? Oh, he is saying the same education and skill. Existing existing developers and uh, other uh, skill other training engineers. Uh, there have been a uh, lot of like training happening. IT is an art based uh, industry, and uh, IT is our uh, IT associates are all large workers. Uh, there is a constant. Uh, training happening there are some macro factors that uh, we talk about in terms of external factors like uh, visa visa situation or uh, latest uh, technologies happening uh, but we have a strong uh, north base in india and if the people can be skilled again uh, i don't see any reason why we should do this all right all right well let's uh, let's uh, get some more clarity on this you know it seems like at this point there really is no uh, light at the end of the tunnel for many of the IT big rigs here in India and perhaps even some of the IT companies outside. Uh, uh, once India, uh, the post war, really many people would think about IT jobs and they would say, you know, India is a hub for uh, outsourcing. And as you mentioned, the IT sector likely to face more headwinds in the coming months. So what exactly are the challenges? Who's going to be impacted? And is there a plan in place in case more and more jobs are going to be cut from the IT sector? Well, let's take a look at this report. IT Why he is talking about much about uh, education training because uh, AI and robotics they cost drastically down almost one tenth of BPO. So currently monthly is three thousand US dollar, now down to five hundred US dollar. So India and the Philippine BPO company they try to catch up kind of. You know, advanced technology otherwise they cannot survive and maybe many people thinking about japanese company try to implement by themselves like ai robotics no 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 this Philippine india come indian company they try to import software from the united states and drastically reducing cost and also they're going to sell the japanese company or american company very added and drastically cutting down the cost from three thousand to have hundred years to right? And behind the scenes, that's the reason those people are talking about training and education and so forth. Companies across the world are gearing up for a big challenge ahead. With multiple issues before these mega 
enterprises, a report by McKinsey predicts a global job cut of over 2 lakh jobs. This is uh, 2 lakh means in India world, uh, 100,000. Hi, 100,000, this means 200, this is 200,000. Per year, for the next 2 to 3 years. And the worst hit would be the Indian workforce. Large scale cut offs are already common with companies pushing almost 1 to 2 percent of their workforce out owing to poor performance last year. But the staggering layoff predictions are a cause of worry for those employed in this sector. We have two options. One is like you, you can resign today and you get a four months uh, salary. Otherwise, you have a two months notice period. So it's your option. You need to resign. You need to decide. So they gave me a day and asked me to decide. They asked me. To oh, this he got the interview. He's he's laid off person. Myself, so like, there was no mails or no written formats or nothing. There's no official documents at all. And they also said like in our background check or documents, it will be like voluntarily resign. The mismatch in skill set and market requirements, the glaring need to reskill the existing workforce and the need to create more jobs in the United States and Europe are some of the reasons for these job cuts. In this cognition mass termination, more, more than 25,000 people part MS rating, uh, actually fourth packet rating in the annual performance appraisal. So every day they are getting call from the HR to give the forceful resignation letter. So, so far I think more than 3,000 people got affected, like directly uh, they were asked to put the paper. But I think in the downtime, another one or, one or two months, it will be more than 20,000 people going to get affected by the condition. While the companies remain tight-lipped over the issue of handing out pink slips, the report predicts difficult times ahead for the IT industry. It remains to be seen if the government will step in to safeguard the interests of those employed in India. Bureau report, Leon. Well, we're joined now by Chris Lakshmi, the Managing Director of Headhunters, a recruitment consulting company from Chennai. Thanks for joining us. How much should India, especially with regard to the IT industry, be concerned about this latest fine? Okay. It is not a question of India. It is a question of people who are in the English industry. Uh, because uh, the Indian economy is overall doing very well. There are really jobs coming up in other sectors. For instance, you take the infrastructure sector, which is doing extremely well, they call it government uh, focusing on that. In the IT sector, what is happening is that there is a quantum change, which is not, you cannot compare this and say what happened last year and the previous year. Automation is the most important change which has happened in this sector. Because of automation, not only in the sector, but in banking, you name it, everywhere, automation is going to create, you know, destroy jobs. Let us face it, uh, according to the study made by World Bank and uh, then Cambridge University, about 60% of the jobs, as you and I know, in India will disappear in the next five. Okay, he said uh, quantum change, drastical change occurring. Any kind of looking at the, like a banking in other industry, and 60% of jobs disappear in the next five years. Yes. So it is going to be a difficult thing. We all have to come to uh, yeah, All right, let me now sorry, go to uh, Chaitanya next, who's standing by. Uh, Chaitanya, what type of employees in IT firms are going to be impacted with this? Is it just a top level position? And if you are someone who's in the IT industry, you know, what are some of the other options that those people can have in case they're unfortunately out of a job? Chaitanya. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, see, uh, uh, there is a, a big uh, hype about uh, two lakh employees uh, getting uh, uh, getting 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 laid off. But if you look at uh, uh, total number of jobs in IT industry in India, there are, there are about forty lakh, and uh, it's only five percent of the total workforce. And uh, what's happening is uh, most of the times uh, this workforce that is the so-called layoffs. Uh, are happening either at uh, the mid or top level where there is uh, uh, middle level management uh, and uh, because of optimizations there is not enough people to be managed there and uh, there is a there is a put, there is a, a leave that uh, they're asking for the second thing that uh, we need to look at is uh, lower level or uh, engineers uh, who are skilled 
I don't see any reason uh, for them to be worried. Uh, we are hiring, and similarly, there are. Uh, uh, he said the 200,000 people lay off is no problem. We have still, he said, optimistic. A lot of, uh, lot of companies I know are actually hiring. Despite the visa issue that people talk about, uh, uh, the pipelines are strong. Uh, we have a strong pipeline from the US itself. Uh, so 5%, 200,000, 5% means how much? Oh, he just called it, not 5%, 200,000. It's actually the India. 10 million people is higher, higher on the IT industry. But as you see, I mean, like if you look at this uh, industrial uh, revolution, per se, is, is actually happening in IT now in terms of automation or in terms of uh, what's happening. See, any like routine jobs or any job that can be well defined is going to be automated and the person doing it has to move into a different skill set. When it happened uh, in the like, early 19, 19, 1900s, the people who were uh, do who were working in the like textile textile industries, they actually learned how to run those machines, how to maintain those machines. Similarly, what's going to happen is when the big data or this automation or, or artificial intelligence kind of technologies are going to take over, you still need people who okay, he is talking about get new skill who can yeah. understand uh, how this systems work and uh, how to configure them, uh, feed data to them, work with them. So there, there are opportunities in terms of like analytics, data science, uh, automation, uh, all over the place. All right. And, uh, yeah. all right, let me go to Sanjeev next with regards to that. Sanjeev, my question to you is we just talked about perhaps it's a new skill set that we have read through the not just executive, sometimes even fresh grads who really aren't up in the market may be losing out, but if someone is in the IT industry, are there things that they should perhaps start brushing up their skill sets on cloud computing, big data, other skill sets that are more hot in the IT industry now that perhaps were not a decade ago, you know, things that are now more obsolete because of other uh, uh, inventions? Look, I mean, I, I think if I may make three very short points. Absolutely. Number one, you know, I'm dismayed by the fact that industry seems to be in denial about the fact that there's a problem. This is never a good sign. You know, it's not industry's fault. So why is industry always apologizing for letting people go? It's a very mad, normal and natural thing that, that happen, except in the best uh, case companies, which I mentioned one of them. So I think we should get real. There is a problem. I think we have to face it squarely. NASCOM has to face it. Industry has to face it. And the government has to face it. Absolutely. And solutions can be found. But if so this is not industry fault, and they need to consider for the how to find a solution to fix it. We are always in denial, no solutions are different. Right? But what about the specifics? So, so, so on the specifics, you know, I mean, look, if you're a technology worker, you know, you are trying to discover the technology frontier even when you have a job and even when you're working on your present job. Sure. Right? And if you're not in that league of going to the next step continually, then you need to suffer. You should go into, you know, healthcare, or you should go into, uh, you know, a human-related business. What about automation? I'm actually getting a live Instagram right. I mean, here. We're saying automation is a great place to be shamani thing. That's a good, you know, part of that to be. What, what are your thoughts? Automation is the biggest killer for jobs. You know, automation is not just IT jobs. Automation is going to kill off lawyers. It's going to kill off chartered accountants. But what people always need? The He's saying. Actually, we don't need lawyer, we don't need accountant. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Next five years, majority of lawyers work, accountant work, will s disappear. Always will need IT, right? Or is it sort of now perhaps not as much of a need as it was a decade ago? No, IT, I, the IT hour in India, if you look at India, see, there is an enormous public sector out there that has barely scratched the surface of IT. We do not, we are not a IT enabled public sector and I include banks and the PSUs of everybody in that. All right. And we have the small scale industry and the small businessman which has not even, you know, entered into that area yet. So the enormous capability, so there is a, you know, as CK Prahlad used to say, right, there's a huge fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. This is, he is talking very good point. Huge fortune you have, even if small size company, right? 
because IT revolution. IT unfortunately has always scratched the dollars at the top. Right, they have to get real and get their hands dirty. It's that, all right? Unfortunately, we are out of time. It's certainly an engaging discussion from all of our guests. Uh, uh, the IT sector in India hit hard with many jobs at stake. We'd like to take a moment to think. Okay, this video uh, talking about uh, 200,000 laid off people is uh, in, the, in the IT industry, IT market. But uh, many people opinion don't worry. This actually currently employed in the IT industry, they have 10 million people there, and uh, we need to reconsider the, uh, the job skill, and those people, workers, need to reconsider, uh, they change their careers, and for that purpose, they need to get education and skill change. And company owner, you have even though your small company, you have big opportunity for chasing for uh, future IT industry. This is this people message. But Indian people, they are seriously considered for this kind of point, right? Okay, this one. Hello, Mr. Kevin. Yes. Mr. Prashant Kevin, um, the the idea that they made in this video that this industry, and especially the IT industry in India, has been designed to Force the company to lay, uh, lay off. Yeah. Um, after the project will be completed. Not not yeah. completed. It, they are just uh, okay. Traditional uh, skilled worker, they try to hire. Traditional skilled worker, uh, they need to focus on. They try to uh, emphasize any other company. Try to give them opportunity to give them uh, skill training, education. And uh, 200,000 people fired. Those people is uh, they don't change, or they are working traditional you know, kind of operator, something like that, or middle <laughs> middle class managers. They don't need. So I discussed in the video that they may be still uh, enough job opportunity not in the IT industry, uh, advanced IT industry, but in the healthcare, the other the sectors and. Is there any the company who can uh, manage the personnel like staff service or um, the personnel a personnel agent um, who will manage that skill the traditional even the skill the traditional skilled person uh, will will find that help them find. Uh, the new job in different sectors. Oh, okay. Is there an agent to bridge the okay. process? This is depends on those people. Depends on those people. Anyway, the current you know, traditional operator or workers support to be fired. And the uh, percentage is, they said 5%, but I think less than that. 200,000, just very, very few employees. And those people are going to be fired. But those people, if they're going to be hired again, and they need to uh, get the education, get the skill training, and so forth. Otherwise, they cannot be hired again. But so well, is these, any, these people get the older person different. Yeah. Yeah, is there any company who is helping that person? Uh, those who those who are, are laid off to find a new job. I mean, yeah, those, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, need to help them. Yeah, I don't uh, survey the kind of company uh, in, in India, but actually they exist. And these, these companies, all the same as Japan, they are introducing uh, the, the new company, but also they give them uh, professional training. <laughs> and they can change the direction, the industry, and the career path, so forth. <coughs> Otherwise, they cannot be hired. Only, only a simple, like a, Today I don't show you the uh, actual case, you know, example, and the simple uh, call, call operator uh, will not be uh, employed uh, next five years. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, all majority of the work is replaced by robotics. Mm -hmm. So okay. now is five percent, but next uh, they say six percent of work will disappear. He said in bank and something and the kind of white color people. And instead, those, what they're going to do, okay, 
tell the truth. And the white color people, they cannot get job anymore in, and in India or in Japan. And because of the, uh, the, those, you know, uh, the BP operator will go replace those people. So those people cannot be hired if they don't have a specialized skill or like a simple, you know, uh, banker or a salesperson. They, banker said, the well, bank said, fire them. They don't need to. And uh, my guess is next 10 years, I think in Japan, 20 million people are going to be laid off. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we don't need any kind of company, the headquarters, like a Sumitomo Chemical, 5,000, they can fire more than 2,000. No need. Okay? So this kind of work is going to Philippines, going to India, going to uh, China, and uh, those companies are adopt, adopting AI and robotics, and aut automatic answer systems they're going to implement it instead of 3,000 to to 500 US dollars. Very cheap person. One person uh, is uh, is just only 500, right? Mm. Why not they're going to use instead of, uh, you know, just actual real human being? Right? Mm -hmm. So those people, okay, just you, you said that the company, okay, just recruiting company exists, but uh, this is different. They're going to, the content of their business will going to change. Normally, mm. you know, the senior people, 40, 50 years old, they are looking for a new job. No, sorry, sorry, you can't find out. You know. Oh. <laughs> that okay. Yeah, I also have to be careful. Oh, you have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now moving to the one more Infosys. Uh, this is some little bit about the robotic process automation. P uh, RPA. Okay, Infosys RPA. The constant need for customer to innovate and optimize their. Uh, processes beyond cost arbitrage, automation delivered benefit to both customer and BPO service provider. The Infosys RPA, robot, Robotic Process Automation, very famous. Now it's Japan, in Japan, it's prevailing. Delivered cutting edge automation and robotics and uh, is clear uh, trendsetter achieving pro uh, process pa perfection by infusing intelligence into automation. Maybe this, I, I forget, this is maybe just, uh, we're going to give some uh, example there. Maybe they have something. So today, is, this is the final video for India. Maybe this is uh, seven minutes or something. Oh, just a good timing. Yeah, next week Bangladesh. <laughs> okay, this one is. Uh... In the age of robotic assembly lines, driverless cars, and drones, cutting edge automation and robotics are scripting a silent revolution in the BPM sector, shifting the focus from cost reduction through labor arbitrage to driving business value through innovation. Oh, Typically, business Show process media. operations span a wide variety of rule-based and knowledge-based work. From regular, repetitive rule-based work to complex, knowledge-based work involving judgmental and cognitive skills, a large chunk of this work can be automated by using robotics process automation. Did you see this? I'm I going to explain something for you. They automatically pick some data by AI. Okay, so not 100%, maybe 85% automatically they're going to handle it. Not 100%. Some cases handwriting, mm -hmm. some cases just difficult to recognize, so but <coughs> 85%. A large chunk of this work can be automated by using robotics process automation, RPA. RPA enables straight through you can see this, some business processes with the balance value added work being handled through deep domain capability. The objective is a near zero touch process where any touch, if necessary, is only for specific value added activities, ensuring innovative service design, improving efficiency, amplifying business value, and enhancing customer experience. Reimagining BPM through a massive embrace of automation and artificial intelligence is Infosys RPA, delivering business processes service stack. Take the case of this global high-tech... By the way, this kind of video, any company, they preparing 
similar video, Accenture, Infosys, Micro, every company, they can do this the same video. In the conventional same. model, work would involve toggling between a dozen client applications and tools and manual data extraction. To Why? Because this is very easy to sell. Show three minutes video, they're going to buy. Right? Processing case. Very easy. The inherent drawbacks, time elapse, low. So, former Accenture people, everybody <laughs> focus on this AI and RPA. Okay? Very easy to start job. You have better do it. Quality <laughs> and poor customer experience. Infosys RPA as a service has changed all that. While 87% of orders undergoes... By the way, I visited two companies already, RPA company. And uh, the one is American company. They started this here in Japan, just not, not within one year. One guy just only hired this July, and they are looking for 50 people for the salespeople and engineer. But they cannot hire those people immediately. But now the 30 client is, uh, is, uh, is suspending suspending you know. straight through touchless processing within the client environment 87 percent passes through and 30 percent going down for the funnel are processing. routed to infosys where the remaining 13 yeah. percent gets processed okay, as is. touchless to the extent possible through the infosys rpa automation software this leaves approximately right. four to six percent so that's the reason why cost is one test single right. touch domain intervention Infosys teams are now applying artificial intelligence in all exception fallout cases to enhance zero-touch, near-touchless processes. The Infosys RPA stack is powered by components that can handle different channel and data types. Some of the key components are the data extraction, enrichment, and entry component, which addresses the largest chunk of operations in every VPN, minimizing or eliminating regular and repetitive data capture entry-related activities. The smart environment component spans all process areas, providing smart updates with minimal or no effort. The reporting and insights component automates another crucial BPM service, standard operation procedure-based reporting and reconciliation activity, enhanced with decisive insights and predictive analyses. And the auto query resolution component removes the hassle of responding to those endless queries. Going beyond the automation of repetitive rule-based work, Infosys RPA ensures touchless processes, leveraging artificial intelligence techniques across various industry verticals and services with minimum configuration. In addition to being accurate, scalable, robust, non-disruptive, non-intrusive, and low on maintenance, Infosys RPA is process agnostic, can be implemented rapidly, and ensures quick ROI. In an era where innovation-led disruption is the name of the game, Infosys RPA is a clear trendset achieving process perfection by infusing intelligence into automation. So, if you're thinking of process perfection through touchless automation, we're game. Okay, this is information advertised for new people. Okay. You know that you know Sophia, right? Yes. Hmm? I know. This oh, one? Yeah. You know, right? Yeah. Do you know the Amelia? Amelia? No. No. Hmm? Mm. My eyes feel it's wrong. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of company is that? Huh? Amelia. No, no, not company. This is a uh, robot. Uh, no, not like. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no, Amelia. Huh? <laughs> Maybe I have something wrong, not the name. Emalia? Emalia? Haha, what is that? Oh, huh? oh this one. Amelia, this one. Amelia, right? Why was... What's this? With my name? 
L or R? L? L, okay. Amelia. Oh, this one. But I didn't find this. Amelia. Oh, this, maybe this one. SEB, one of Sweden's largest banks, is about to change the face of customer service in financial institutions. The company is the first to call services to Amelia as she grows into her new with different problems of success rate. Uh, we feel that uh, she goes one step further oh, yeah. by learning to speak Swedish, making this her first non-English live deployment. She is the only uh, this one is busy. She's uh, she is this uh, she is only screen. When customers are happy uh, or angry. Sorry to hear that. She tracks the customer's emotions in a three and adapts her responses and gestures accordingly. She's only screen. This allows her to deliver personalized Sophia is just a robot. But she is on screen. Amelia is already Amelia. being adopted by large organizations Very in famous. Europe and the US Most across other a range of roles and, for example, has been trained to manage invoice and queries from suppliers for a global oil and gas company, handle IT service desk queries for a European bank, Assist frontline customer service agents for a U.S. media company and provide policy guidance to all the implemented for many companies. You know. Best of all, you're going to call Amelia them, is you're going to ask them, she's going to answer for you conversations in parallel instead of and, and professional every day of the year, whatever time of day or night you need to contact her. This is a new one. I really enjoy helping my colleagues and customers be more productive and look forward to working with you. Also, Accenture is the main joint venture with this company. Amelia. Okay, so any question? Later, I have one. I, I certainly have one business idea I would like to ask for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Takashi, any question? Huh? You okay? Okay? Takashi, don't misunderstand this Saturday. I need to go into Fukuoka, so. Saturday, we don't have school on Saturday. I'm switching to next Monday. Monday. Yeah, Monday. Monday, Monday morning. Uh, Monday and the morning, morning, Ed will going to have, uh, uh, he, what he going to do next Monday? Um, uh, I forgot that. He's going to do, huh? No. Japanese companies, uh, overseas investment. I can't remember which company he's going to do. But the next Monday morning at afternoon, I'm going to teach uh, Greece democracy and Roman democracy. Afternoon. Okay. Uh, no Monday. Saturday, Monday. Ah, okay. But Monday you work, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I keep working. So you can join, okay? No problem. I forget that you are in Vietnam, so. <laughs> uh, so you can do. Okay, but uh, I try to make recording for you. So, uh, but problem is today already I recorded, but I don't know how to do this. How how to do this? Just just uh, here. Ed told me that we're going to pod recording. Maybe this one.